before you, and for the public to know, there are really two documents for the proposed budget. One is in this green folder. And as you know, uh, in this green folder, there are, this really is, uh, contains all of the requirements that the state has for a proposed budget for every school system. There are key reports, there are individual pages for each school. So I'm going to go over those in just a moment. And then you have a smaller document, which we're just in the bulk of our time talking about, and that is the small one here that says proposed annual budget, and it's primarily the general fund that we're discussing. Uh, I think we have plenty of these smaller documents for the public. Uh, if there's anyone that absolutely has to have one of these green documents, we have a few in the back, but all of this will be on our website by the end of the day. It will be in different components, parts, but it will, it will be on the website. So all of this, everything is being presented to the will be there. So what you have in front of you on the screen is the cover page for the green document. And let me just walk you through again briefly how you can use this information in the green document. Uh, the first few pages in that green document are is the preface. It has just general information about how a budget is developed. Uh, and then after you get through those first several pages, then you come to what is called the P reports. And the first one is called the P1 report. And it's probably um, 10 or 12 pages into that document. The P1 report has six pages to it. It's called P1 A, B, C, D, E, and F. The first five pages uh, list all of the revenues for the budget, and they're broken down by the various categories. The, on the fifth page, E, at the bottom, you'll see total revenues, total all sources. So you have total revenues and total all sources. That represents all of the revenue that's in the budget. And then you have expenditures. And on this page and the top of the next page, that is the expenditures summarized very briefly in the just function areas by fund type. Uh, so uh, you, can, you can see all of this, and all of this corresponds to other documents that you have here. So that's the P1 report. Following the P1 report, you have a P2 report. What I have showing you on the screen is for volume. Every cost center has a two-page P2 report, and it lists all of the expenditures that are coded to that particular cost center number. And um, so Baldwin, you can see that some is coded to the general fund, some special revenue, um, and so forth. And so there are two pages for each school. Then when you get to the end of that section, which is probably three quarters into the document, and you're just going to have to flip over a bunch of pages to get to the end of the P2 reports, you're going to see this page. Let's see if we can find that. Again, it's about three quarters of the way into the green document. So it's way down at this. So. And this is probably, this section is the most informative and interesting of the sections in this document because following this page, you've got a page uh, for system totals, they we go into that. And on system totals, what you see is all of those figures, and we'll see them again in another document in a moment, but all of those are what the units that we earned last year based on our ADM, our average daily membership for 20 days after Labor Day, and then that translated into the state appropriations bill where we were funded X number of dollars based on uh, how the legislature funded all school systems. At the very bottom of that page, you've got projected employees, and it's broken down by uh, state-funded uh, positions, other state-funded, federal, and local. Really, the bottom line of that page is the, the grand total, and let me flip over to it to make sure that I can read it. Yeah. The figure that I'm looking at is right here at the bottom, right there. And it's 3847. That's the projected number of positions that are in our budget this year. That's down a few from last year. Uh, as you know, and as we'll discuss in a, a little while, we did cut the number of custodial positions. That was through attrition and vacancies. And also 
uh, child nutrition program positions, but there were also some increases. Every time you open a new school, you're certainly going to have some increased staffing, and that was the case this year. There were also a few other initiatives and um, some uh, areas that, that we picked up a few positions in. But overall, we're down probably 15 positions compared to last year's budget. So that's that page. On the next page, uh, this has information that I think will be helpful for you to read uh, as you go through it. Um, it talks about the fact that because Park Crossing is a new school, you're not going to see an individual school page for Park Crossing because we didn't have ADM for them last year. There were no funds generated for Park Crossing, so, so you won't have a page for them. Uh, it also refers to the fact that uh, the uh, Acceleration Academy has been moved from, uh, from what was part of PACE and now it's fused, it's like separate cost center. So that, that shows up a little differently too. Uh, the other thing, the very last statement at the bottom of that page, it talks about the level of degree. And I'll, I'll point this out, but I want you to see this note here. It says the distribution of degrees for certified personnel is based on the 2013 state personnel report developed in October 2012. Meaning that there's really no way that we can determine early enough exactly who is employed and what their degrees are for this year. So we just try to reflect what is in effect a profile of last year's um, staffing for degrees and distribution. Okay. Now on the next page, this begins the, whole, the section where you have one page for every school. The first page though at the top, you'll see that it says at the very top right up there, it says combined information for. All of the other pages following that are for a specific school, but we have some that, that the State Department lumps into what is called just a combined or Montgomery County Board of Education number. So this year those included MTEC, PACE, McKinnis Youth Facility, uh, and then we, a Children's Center, um, we have two sites, as you know, residential sites, the Father Purcell and the Montgomery Children's Specialty Center. We have bed counts there, but those all feed into the funding of Children's Center. And um, the reason those are bed counts as opposed to counting the ADM is because they are non-ambulatory, they are not transported into the schools, so they are, they're served at those sites. Um, and then we also get some bed counts for Second Chance, Grantwood, and the residential treatment centers. So all of those are factored in to this page. Then the next page, just go on to the next page, there we go. Then you've got Baldwin, and you're gonna see that Baldwin, like all the other schools behind it, their ADM last year was 578.8, these are their earned units. This is the amount of money generated based on their earned units. And part of this money is based on the LEACH report and the, the degrees and experience that we report to the state. Now, look at the bottom of that page and you can just look right here. This is where I was talking about the degrees distribution. All of this is really not reflective of the 2013-14 year. It really represents a profile of the degrees distribution for last year. Okay. Any questions on this? Yeah. Yes, sir. <coughs> Come from the source of funding, and, and certainly when we look at the non certified support personnel, it states here that state funds about 40.19 and federal about 5.0 for, you know, I'm looking at local and local 5.91, so it gives about 51.10. Now, this is the total number of support personnel that we have working in that location, that school. Well, the, it, there's a, a line, Mr. Porto says non-certified support personnel. Right. And that would be your not your classified personnel. Right. So your the total custodian, is, secretaries, lunchroom. Right. So a, if, if the state is uh, funding 40, the federal is funding five, and local is funding about six, then the, the question is, do we have that number of uh, non-certified support personnel working at that site? We have eight working at that site that are funded, that we designated as being funded by the state. And if you go out to the federal column five, so 
So there's a grand total of 13 support personnel. That first column where it says state earned is 40.19. Yes, sir, but that's the total of teachers, librarians, counselors. That's everybody. Yes, sir, that's everybody. Okay. Yes, and, and I will tell you, it's, it's a good thing to point out, on the line for non-certified support personnel, where 13 is the total for that line, that usually Okay, is, I see eight in line. You've got eight from the state and the federal. Yes, sir. Okay. And, and the eight probably will be your custodians and clerical staff. Okay. In some schools, uh, you may have an eight or two. Uh, and then the federal is going to be your child nutrition program and special ed aides. That's probably going to make that. So you can go through every, every school, but that's how you use this information. The very last page of this document has a response form, which is always included, but I've never had anyone return a response form to me, but it's in here in the, in the, in the, um, uh, on the website. So let's turn our attention then to the proposed end with the small document. After the cover page, you see <coughs> two pages, a spreadsheet which you're familiar with because we do this for both the original budget and then when we amend our budget twice during the year, you also have a similar uh, spreadsheet. So let's just look at this one first. At the very top, the main fund sources we're going to be talking about today that are described in detail in this uh, document are these fund sources, the Foundation Program, State School Nurses Program, State Technology Coordinator, Alabama Reading Initiative, Transportation, and Local Fund Source. So that's, those are the fund sources we're talking about today. You also have in the budget, but we're not going to talk about it in detail, a career tech operations and maintenance uh, fund source, $182,000. Uh, Children's First, uh, ESL, Gifted, State at Risk, Preschool, uh, a JAG grant of $33,000, and then, a, a, this is new to us, a state career tech bond issue of a million dollars, which will come in very, very handy with the career tech program. So that's all part of the general fund. And as you know, our, our accounting system is divided into fund types. So you have the general fund, and you have special revenue, and in the budget, uh, that includes IDEA, federal preschool, and all of those, including Title I. I'll point out to you in this section, all of the federal fund sources experience cuts this year because of sequestration. So Title I lost about $700,000, uh, Title II about $100,000, um, Special Education IDEA lost uh, over $300,000, and actually the effect of all of those cuts is even greater when you factor in that we have a 2% raise, and so much of our budget is personnel. So if you increase everybody by 2% plus their normal step raise, and then um, fringe benefits also increase. So, the, for example, IDEA, even though it was a $313,000 cut, when you factor in the salary and fringe benefits increases, it was really more like a $470,000 cut for us that we would sustain if we had maintained all of the positions that we had. What that meant is that we had to shift some some funding from IDEA into the general fund, even though there were some net cuts with that program. Right. Yes, sir. Were, were these cuts uh, a percentage across the board? They were. They were? Okay. What was it? It was about 6%, I think. It, it varies. So I, one program would take bigger the, the, only, the only thing that would vary is that <clears throat> our allocation may vary from year to year based on the data that is determined on, but then it's cut by the same percentage, right? But ultimately, our Title I funding was cut by about $700,000. Mm -hmm. right. so, so that's... Yeah, which is why I'll just add that mm -hmm. we ask departments to make decisions about prioritizing what they're used for, mm -hmm. knowing full well everybody could keep everything they wanted, mm -hmm. uh, which is difficult for some people. Mm -hmm. So that was an issue for us. And of course, Ms. Thompson is well aware of what she was very involved in. There was a lot of discussion with Title I, particularly with that huge loss of funds, and so what was the best way to use those funds? So the major shifts in, in use of Title I funds. So many of our schools are Title I. 
Okay, then if you look at the bottom of this page of that spreadsheet, you get into debt service. And the debt service, that's the fund where we try to record all of our debt service payments. Some have to be in fund 14, but, but most are in this. And really all you have is the QSCAP, those three. And you remember that we make sinking fund payments. We don't really make debt service payments. It's a sinking fund payment. It's like a, a principal and interest payment, but it goes into a fund at the state. And they're going to keep it for 17 years and then make a lump sum payment at the end. So it's treated a little differently. And that's why we call it a sinking fund payment, but it's the same thing as a debt service payment. And then we have a couple of uh, uh, bond issues here that you know, we're, uh, debt we're paid for uh, that are listed there. Then on the next page at the top, let me spend just a, a few minutes talking about capital projects because obviously that's a big, uh, big line item for us. Ms. Portal, you, you mentioned last time correctly that we have exceeded our budgeted expenditures for capital projects. That's because last year I only budgeted it for fiscal year 13, $18 million uh, in capital projects for Park Crossing. But we're really further along in the expenditures of those funds, and that's why we'll probably end up with $25, $26 million in actual expenditures this year for capital projects. But of course, all of that was already funded. It just wasn't the figures not included in the budget. What I have in this budget for capital projects, let me just walk you through the easy ones and then I'll come back to fund source 2120. The first one, 1320, a million 542, is fleet renewal. You can <coughs> use that to purchase buses or to pay debt service on buses. We are very fortunate and thrilled that we're getting 6,000 per bus this year uh, because we got less than uh, $5,000 for the last few years. And so uh, we've been fortunate that we have never, even though we have borrowed a lot of money to purchase buses over the years so that we were constantly keeping our fleet renewal money coming because we didn't want to have our fleet more than 10 years old because once they run out of that 10 years, you no longer get fleet renewal money for them. We've been fortunate that we've always been able to pay our debt service strictly with fleet renewal money and not have to dip into the general fund. And, and with this bump uh, this year, we'll be able to pay off our $8.3 million loan uh, probably in December and then we'll be paying on the $2.7 million loan, a significant portion of that. So uh, we feel very good about where we are with fleet renewal right now. Now, then you've got, let's skip to, go to 84, 10, 12, and 13. Those are your leveraged bond issues. We used that money up long ago, primarily in phase one, uh, several years ago. So this is strictly debt service you see there. And then you've got the QSCAP, we used all of that up. So what you see here is strictly debt service. All of that money is, is withheld from our PSF funds. And so we just, it doesn't come to us, yes ma'am. It's held, withheld by the state. We just recorded as a revenue and expenditure. The state actually pays us money on our behalf, but they subtract it from the amount of money that actually comes to us for our PSF funds. Then let's go back to the fund source 2120. A million 950 is what I'm projecting that we'll begin this year with. Uh, and the, the main things we have in there, we do have a couple of things that we added last year that are still in there this year that are have in the past been operating expenses and still are operating expenses, but we can use these funds for it. And that is $900,000 for uh, property insurance on all of our facilities and um, then about a million dollars for um, two debt service, uh, the free tech bond issue and the train loan. So those are reflected in there too. And then also in that six million, there's four million in that that I budgeted to, to use up the rest of the city money. And so there's four million in revenue and four million in expenditures to finish out their $15 million bond issue. That they it does show up. It, it is showing it's it's up part of that $6 million. And, and for capital projects, at the very bottom, we, if you want to take the time to read that later, there's, I think, hopefully, the same information I've tried to explain to you now is in written form right there. Okay. And then the last fund type is fiduciary. And the only thing we start out with 
is your local schools non-public. So here is the bottom line. Uh, total revenues after you subtract transfers uh, and indirect costs, because we don't want that to be counted twice. So you've got, what is that, 270 million, 990, so about 271 million in revenue, and about 271, 395 in expenditures. And um, the area that revenues, um, expenditures exceed revenues would, um, you know, be primarily, I think, uh, ex well, capital projects would be one of those where we are expending just a little bit more than we have budget revenue. But if I were if I were saying to you, if I were saying to the press or anyone else, what is our budget this year? We normally would say it's expenditures, so it's about a two hundred seventy-one million dollar budget for fiscal year fourteen. Yeah, but that means, Professor uh, Brother, are we going to be, you know, guiding them? The revenues being at 271, let's say 271 million, and the expenditure of 271.4, and that's going to be about 400,000 short. Well, there are, there are some fund sources where the ending balance will be less than the ending balance, for example, in capital projects right there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little bit less. But the general fund, uh, Debbie, if you'll go back to the previous page, at the very top, you'll see in the general fund, revenues do exceed expenditures for budgeted amount. And um, the areas where revenues um, are less than expenditures, we would simply take the reserve to cover that. So the funds are there to cover. So Mr. Lover, does this reflect what we are expecting as far as savings from the general fund and this? Bottom line, have that in there because we have for a right. There are some, some of those in there, and there are certainly some initiatives that have not implemented, been implemented yet that we will see down the road. There, and so some of them will be implemented right. further the, down the line. The main areas that uh, the lean frog recommendations are reflected in this budget is reduction of custodial staff of about 25 positions mm -hmm. and then CMP reduction there. And the CMP has this uh, effect on pass-through money as well as um, indirect costs. So it's a little complicated, but well, those two, the two areas. It's my understanding, we haven't implemented, I thought we were just uh, piloting the program to see how well it work. And then uh, it's also my understanding that um, when we look at um, the um, bus room workers as well as custodials, um, we are, uh, matter of fact, um, impacting them quite negatively with the larger workload. And by understanding, some are even working overtime in terms of trying to get the job done, whereas they have employees stay. Now, when are we going to, is this just piloting? Uh, I don't recall us really implementing that total pilot that program through all my schools. And so far, from what I've uh, observed and what I'm hearing, um, it lean frog is somehow like, a, I guess you got a killer instinct to it because he's taking some out of folk out. And the thing about that, um, we, we, we certainly need to take a close look at that in terms of whether or not we are just overwhelming the individuals that we have in both um, let's say the custodial staffs as well as lunchroom workers. I think we need to look at that. Before that would be a question for me. Well, let me just answer a little bit. Basically, what we did is through attrition. So these are people who are retired or resigned that we did not replace. We didn't eliminate any people that currently have jobs. And what LeanFrog is doing is moving them around to accommodate where the needs are. And they're still doing that. They're still shifting it back, just like in these classrooms. I think today Ms. Pitts and Ms. Scipio met with principals to reassign teachers based on needs. They're still doing the same thing for custodial and food service. But that was really what that was. We didn't hire people back in that position. So we are waiting to see how that looks and how that functions. Very much like classroom teachers. Today we moved three teachers from Trump. Uh, so we are very much doing that even though our enrollment is up 485 students. It just reflects the fact that we're moving to the students are. So the same thing for custodial and food service. In other words, Tracy, what I'm saying, we've increased the number, we've got an increase in number of students. 
and, and, and what was your attrition or whatever, you've lost those individuals who were taking care of some part, some duty and responsibility. Now those same duties and responsibilities have to be taken care of, and as a result of finding that we've got people who are working overtime, and also the, uh, the amount of work that some, some of these individuals are just not able to do it. Um, and, and, and certainly I think um, as we look at that, then uh, consideration needs to be given in regards to those, maybe those that we've lost, some of those might need to be brought back. I don't think back in a little bit on what Dr. Robert is saying. Um, where in this budget, I know we're talking about many problems, we don't want them to be emaciated. What I'm concerned about is the number of employees that are the custodial support and the lunchroom support. Have we already excluded that amount of uh, custodians and lecturer workers that we have. We are impacting them greater than anybody else in the system, and I, I have a concern about that. Yes, ma'am. So where in this budget did you cut based on attrition and all of that? When we go through these pages where we're looking at actual line items for expenditures and we get to the sec sections for uh, custodians, you'll see that there's a reduction of 25 positions in well, this that's budget. That's what I'm talking about. But have we, as a board, voted to do that part of the problem, is what I'm saying. So if we don't vote for it, say the votes are not there to do it, do you have that anywhere in this budget that those people can? No, and that would be adding another $600,000 or so back. To About a million dollars, actually. Yeah. But if it's a million dollars or two million dollars, or whatever, if you don't have plenty of shoes and people to work in This is a balanced budget for the general fund. It doesn't necessarily mean that we've adequately funded some departments, particularly operations and maintenance and security. We've had to uh, added a little back to those departments, but uh, I mean, there are lots of areas, in fact, just about all areas in this budget you could add to, to really truly adequately fund it. So all of the areas have been hit, particularly over the last few years, and then with sequestration that affects federal funding. So it's you know, there, there's not a whole lot of, uh, there's not any fat in this budget. And um, so I understand what you're saying, but. Uh, I just, I, I personally, I just have a real serious issue with that because when you go in some of the schools and if you don't have the custodial help there, they are not taken under consideration. And I talked to the man from Lee Frog about this. 
They are looking at square footage, but they are not looking at, especially the elevator rooms that have uh, restrooms and each room, those rooms have to bathrooms have to. Teachers can't clean bathrooms, that's not in their job description. And, and in some cases, some of those things are happening. And if, I, if we have to cut somewhere else to do this, then we just have to cut somewhere else to do this. But if our schools are not clean, and we're cutting people who are working two or three jobs, like one instance, a young man is going to Trenum, and he, he has to be at, at Trenum at three o'clock, but he has, he has another job. We got to take under consideration those persons that need our help the most. And, I, and I'm not seeing that and I'm not hearing that with the, the cuts that, that you're projecting for in our support. And, 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 and another thing, um, even with that being said, and I certainly you know, agree with you on that, um, as it relates to the calls that I've been getting and the information that I've received relative to that. Mm -hmm. uh, even though, and it continues being said, that we had 19 folk that may have retired or, or whatever, lost them, but the fact of the matter is we may have lost those employees, but we didn't lose the work. Mm -hmm. The work is still there that needs to be done. Uh, and, and certainly, we, we, we talked earlier about uh, uh, you, you know, the organizational chart, especially at the central office level, and you could take one position at the central office level, and then we, that's not a need position. You could probably fund about four or five custodians or, or uh, support personnel. And the thing is, when I'm, 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 it certainly is going to impact this budget once we look at the organizational chart. When we can get that organizational chart here to determine how many actual personnel we're going to need. At the central office level, then we can get a better or clearer understanding <laughs> of where we are in terms of our budget. Because certainly, uh, adjustments are going to have to be made. Yes. I will tell you this: that this budget does reflect reductions in central office staff. It certainly does. Uh, and uh, I don't know what the lean prod final recommendation will be, or what Ms. Thompson said, what you'll receive. I can tell you that what you received last time was more detailed in terms of positions that we already had, they just hadn't been on previous organizational charts. So it wasn't a reflection of additional, a lot of additional new positions, it was just going more deeper into what the existing structure was. And that too has not been going on yet. No, no, it, no. it hasn't. Right, no. and, and this budget is still reflecting our current setup, if you will. Um, but let me, just, let me just go to get the um, um, duties and responsibilities today before our meeting next week so we can look at that and compare it to what those um, um, I believe that's going to be in your packet before we get later today. Okay. That's very true. But let me just add one more thing. With the budget, we also did some things in the budget that we haven't done in years past. And that includes buying additional math books and reading books and those sorts of things. Instructional materials and supplies that this district hasn't done in a number of years. So those are also priorities that we put in there that we've talked about ongoing. The central office uh, organization chart, I believe as Byron said, that was a, a, a model that he was recommending and you fund those positions based on your needs and how your funding is going. Who's, that is, that is Who's recommending that? Byron, he's with Lean Grog. Uh But that's not necessarily something that you're gonna fill immediately. That's the chart that you would look at and see what your needs are. But right now, I think you also are looking at the total district needs and what you have in your budget and what you can do. So then. Let me just go back to Ms. Stella's question just so I make sure you're all understanding. In this budget, it reflects reduction of custodial staff and in an indirect way, it also, I mean, in, in the child nutrition program, it reflects a reduction of CMP staff. That only affects the general fund indirectly. So, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to indirect costs. Where where child nutrition program is going to help, which has not been reflected here, will be in reduced costs for food and other things, which will, uh, you know, directly improve their fund balance. Which then means if it exceeds the two months operating balance, then that's more money that we can reduce uh, in our pass through, and then that comes back to the general fund. So it's. 
if you are lying, you're saying, well, but you're present with monies in terms of what is funded, needed for the uh, child nutrition program. But it's my understanding that cut is going to come as you say with the food items. And the thing is, and what I've uh, been told so far, is that uh, the children won't get anything that's warm. They're getting bag launches, and it's being just it, it's being just a minimum requirement. For That's my understanding, Mr. Porterfield, that the effort the effort is simply to look at are we using are we what we're purchasing are we using it correctly and well and efficiently, and so the hope is uh, that there will be a significant reduction. When you look at and this is from the State Department of Education, when you look at our cost per meal for food food items. Is significantly higher than the state average, and so that's a, that's a focus of where we can try to save money and still provide uh, excellent food and meals to I'd students. like to make a comment to that, and that is based on information from when I met the Blaine Frog, they never mentioned bag food, they never mentioned things that weren't warm, they mentioned breakfast where every child would get a breakfast. They also mentioned, and again, um, I was wrong last time it was with Ms. Ross that I sat in on that meeting, they mentioned breakfast for every child due to making sure that the food cafeteria staff was right sized and the, the materials that they were cooking because a lot of times they over prepare too many meals and so it's to right size the meals that they needed and they were warm meals. They did even mention stations where they can get soup and salad because I mean some children when they get older they don't want a meat and vegetable. They'd rather have soup and salad. So they never mentioned bag meals. The only bag meal my child has received that I'm knowledgeable of is when they've gone on a field trip or something to that effect. But that's not what Lingfrog well, well, I'm, I'm certainly waiting to hear from Lingfrog because in, in some of the schools that I'm hearing that uh, children are being served, well, palliative, yeah. serving them breakfast in the classrooms yeah. and certainly it's not one meal. Uh, certainly all of this needs to be, uh, well, well, you know, at some point it was someone, it was mentioned and it was at some school it was supposed to be, but. Just, just, just a few minutes to talk, yeah. because I know we're not going to send bag lunches into the classroom. Well, I'm sure so I'm I think my son would tell me, because he's a good little eater, well, he would be back. Yeah. 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 This is what yeah. Robert needs to say to a bird, yeah. that's what he's saying. Right. And that Lean Frog would be doing that, but that's community talk. I have heard that at this table. Well, I'd like to visit those schools and make sure that that's not the I, I do want to say that Lean Frog, as Mr. Glover tried to mention earlier, was really concerned that we were paying much more per cost of meal than the state was giving us with the guideline. Usually it's between a dollar range to a dollar thirty, and we were somewhere above a dollar fifty range, typically for our meals. Some that. were much higher than that, and they were concerned that we were wasting food and wasting the money. Not that we weren't going to get kids the good meals, that we were uh, producing a lot of waste. So what Lean Frog does is they come in and look at your production and processes to make sure you aren't wasting money. And that really was what that is. That doesn't the, uh, cause a quality in food uh, problems. It just means that you are, your meals are kind of where they should be. And where most schools are across the state, we are above that range. And he was concerned how much above we were. And um, some of the ordering uh, processes were a little uh, out of whack too. And we are held to a certain standard as yes. far as the nutrition. So That's we right. have to have certain nutrition. Even when that my child has gone on a field trip, they have had a certain the nutrition that they needed and it was nutrients. Thank you. Well if you'll flip to the next page then. Um, this is what you're going to see is this this is a summary of our state funding. Just let me walk you through it very quickly. You'll see that our ADM last year, this is the average enrollment for the 20 days after Labor Day last year was 33,306.5. The previous year is 33, 30, um, 31, I'm sorry, 31,306 and 31,388 uh, the year before. This year we think it will be significantly higher. Actually, the last count right now we're up 485 states. And, and if we are, then let me just point out something. Uh, there is a, um, trying to see if this is in here. You won't see it here, but there's a, a funding called Other Current Units. And for school systems that experience growth in the school years, you do get some additional funding later. 
that's not included in this budget. We don't know how much that will be, but yeah. So in other words, in, uh, from 2013 to 2014, you, you, what you're looking at the uh, well here the is showing 31306.5. Yes, sir. Which that's showing a decrease rather than an increase as uh, reflected in terms of the enrollment that's in the district now because yes, of the yes, sir. Additional students that are coming the, the funding you see the, the the enrollment you see there, remember that's fall of two thousand twelve that determines the fiscal year fourteen funding. It's a year in arrears. It's a year in arrears. So the enrollment, the ADM we have this year, these 20 days after Labor Day, that will fund fiscal year 50. So we're always a year in the rear. Yes, so that means then we are going to get that money at the end of this year, is that correct? No, no sir. No, sir. No. This, this, uh, this funding is all based on a year ago's enrollment plus our police report. And um, so this is set. Our funding for fiscal year 15 will all be based on this year's ADM. And that's fine. And um, it's around October 1st, I believe. It's the 20th day after Labor Day. No, ma'am. We'll get a few minutes. And I'll point out to you in a moment that. So, if you look through this, as you know, then based on our ADM from last year and our LEAPS report, our LEAPS report is our LAA personnel report for <coughs> the degrees that everyone has and their experience, and then that funnels dollars into our budget. Um, so you have all of your teacher units, principals, assistant principals, and so forth. And then again, that generates the money that you see there for salaries, fringe benefits, other current expense, and so forth. You'll see the total foundation program funding we had this year was $165 million. But if you'll see right below that, you'll see $140 million. We're only getting directly from the state $140 million because we have the 10 mil match that we have to put up in local funds. And uh, near the bottom of the page there, you'll see that 10 mil match is $25 million, 940 So when you subtract that $25 million from the $165 million, you come back to the $140 million that we actually receive in state funding. And then you have a few other things here. You've got transportation. Um, I will say that transportation, our funding is down a little because the state's no longer funding uh, some some categories, so it's down. Uh, but Mr. Cox has done a good job of cutting in some areas to offset that production. Um, and then you've got our capital purchase, the six million nine eighty one. That is the PSF money that we refer to. And of that six million nine eighty one, uh, all of the debt service for the QSCAB bond issues, for the leverage bond issues, all of those things are subtracted from that amount. And ultimately, there's only about uh, seven hundred fifty-six thousand dollars left of that that really comes to us that's available for capital projects and uh, expenses. Okay, you're going to see some of these figures. Yes, sir. I see here well, we've got uh, six thousand dollars per bus, we've got a million of one point five million, but then there are zero buses. Um, no, that zero that zero is, is last year's figure. Year. So and they're they not just, purchasing any buses this year? No, sir. That zero in that column is simply the state did not plug in on this sheet what the per bus amount was last year. I don't know why they didn't, but this is a state generated form. And uh, last year, I think the amount was around five thousand dollars. I can't remember, but the six thousand per bus is significantly more than we've been getting, which helps us go ahead and pay off our our debt service on the buses sooner. Okay, let's go to the next page. Now. Okay, as we said, we're only looking at like uh, six or seven fund sources in this particular document that are part of the general fund. And you can go back to the spreadsheet to see which ones those are. But let's let's start with this because these are these are really the funds that we have significant discretion over. All of the other fund sources to some degree uh, have to be spent in certain ways. Um, so you've got the beginning balance of ten and a half million. Now let me talk about that for a moment. That's made up of two fund sources this year. One and a half million out of ARI 
and nine million out of uh, the general fund, funds for 6001. For those of you that were on the board last year, you may remember that the state called us and said, will you take a million dollars early of your fiscal year 13 ARI allocation? Well, this year they called us again and said, will you take a million and a half early of your fiscal year 14 ARI allocation? So the allocation this year was really $2,028,313. But because they're going to go ahead and send us a million and a half in fiscal year 13, then the revenue that we've got there, and you'll see it here, is only that 528,313 because the million and a half that we will receive this year is included in the fund balance, okay? And, and when you get the, to the end of this particular section here, you're gonna see that a statement that says, revenues can exceed, or excuse me, expenditures can exceed revenues by up to a million and a half because we've received the million and a half in revenue this year, but we have to show the expenditures in fiscal year 14. So, having to do the same thing with ARI, which is not a bad deal for us because we get the, the full amount this year instead of getting one twelfth of that each month during the year. So, it, it helps us a little. Okay, so all of these figures you've actually already seen on some other pages. This is our, this is our state funding. Then you go into the, the middle section about impact aid and ROTC. Those are fairly constant. Uh, and then at the bottom, You've got county ad valorem taxes, and without flipping over there, on the top of the next page, you'll see the district ad valorem taxes. And combined, you have the district and the county, and that equals the total ad valorem taxes, our property taxes. Uh, and I projected an increase of about half a million dollars based on what Ms. Buskey sent me as far as uh, an abstract or some information projected for next year. Now, of course, this is this is a half million increase of what we had decreased this year by a million and a half. So um, we're still going to be down in fiscal year 14 compared to fiscal year 12 because fiscal year 13, the current year, is such a drop in that the one taxes. But at least we can budget an increase from fiscal year 13. Sales tax is about the same based on the figures right now. There's a slight increase, so we've increased that a little. Uh, gasoline tax, that's one cent per gallon, and that stays pretty constant. And you know, the business privilege tax is about the same. On the next page, at the top, those are the district taxes, have a lot of taxes. You have uh, helping schools tax, we get $13 and something. Uh, for every uh, helping schools tag that uh, someone purchases and designates it for Wyoming Public Schools. And you can do that anywhere throughout the state. Uh, and then smaller amounts there. Uh, interest, we're not making much in interest. That's probably not a surprise to you right now. So we dropped Nobody. that a little. Nobody is, that's right. Now, um, the Medicaid reimbursement program, this is a, a real positive force through the work of Dr. Whetstone and others. Um, we, uh, the, the Medicaid program is changing, and so we're going to get an increase in our Medicaid uh, now. This was $800,000 uh, last year, and we're uh, projecting an increase of uh, additional 400,000, and we should be getting somewhere between three and 400,000 extra in this year uh, before the end of this fiscal year for some uh, the prior year payments that because it's retroactive to somewhere back in uh, 2012. So that's positive for us. Uh, then go down to indirect cost. Now, indirect cost, the federal programs, you know, it's about 2.8% that we can charge on uh, indirect costs for our federal programs. The child nutrition program, that's a that's about a, a million dollar increase from last year to this year. And it isn't because of anything. It has nothing to do with lean frog. It has nothing to do with, with any of the efficiencies we've made. It only has to do with the fact that the indirect cost rate went up. I think because of the um, because of the era money that we experienced for a few years, that affected our indirect cost rates. 
And so therefore, last year, the indirect cost rate was less than 7%. This year, we're charging 17%. So, uh, but based on the program itself, the program will still be able to fund that. Uh, you're saying that there's a, a million dollars increase in the, in the child nutrition program? No, sir. In, in the indirect cost that we can charge the child nutrition program. Indirect cost? Yes, sir. And it's all tied to a, a rate that the state what? approves for us. Well, what would it look like to me? It's almost about $800,000 more for 2013-14 than for 2012-2013. Yes, sir. If, if you saw the breakdown of last year's between federal programs and, and C&P, C&P was more like 700000 and the federal programs was more like six, $700,000. So federal programs uh, have gone down and the child nutrition program has gone up. Yes, okay. So our total revenues then, $210 million, $229,826 in these fund sources as part of the general fund. Then if you flip to the next page, we get into expenditure line items, and I'm not going to go through every line item. I'll just do, give you the highlights. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Uh, as you see at the top, though, the fringe benefits are always a huge cost of personnel. In fact, for some positions, the fringe benefits cost, because insurance is 85.68 per year, the fringe benefits costs are actually more than the salary you pay them. So it's a, it's a huge, huge cost. Retirement has gone up from 10.08% to 11.71%. And then uh, unemployment went down slightly from 0.45 to 0.25. Let me just throw this in here. Um, effective January 1st, 2013, all persons who became members of the teacher's retirement system and had never been a member of the retirement system are, are, are considered tier two employees as opposed to tier one employees. Their rates are slightly different than this. I did not factor this into the budget because we would have so few that that would even apply to. So I used the 11.71% for all, but it was still 11 something percent, but just not the full 11.71. And you may or may not know that Tier 2 employees, uh, they, we, we withhold from their checks each month 6%, whereas for Tier 1 employees, those that were members prior to January 1, it's 7.5%. But there are some differences in their benefits down the road. So, Okay, let's get into the expenditure areas. You've got kindergarten teachers, regular elementary. Let me just tell you that in these categories, there are some pluses and minuses, you know, there are shifts in enrollment and grade levels, so you're going to see some ups and downs. Overall, for teacher positions system-wide, and that's not just for those on this page, but also on the following pages for special ed, for uh, alternative, for career tech, all of those combined, we're up about 10 positions compared to last year for teacher positions. And um, a lot of that can be attributed to open new school. Now, I will say this, you know, there are certainly going to be pressures to hire more teachers because of the increased enrollment, but we're certainly going to try to uh, maintain what we have right now. Let me point out to you at the bottom of the page, uh, secondary athletics coaches, you may remember um, that for years, the um, junior high program was handled by the city, and then that transitioned to become an MPS responsibility. And we budgeted last year $350,000 for middle school athletics and for ninth grade athletics at the high schools. Um, what I decided to do this year is where the salaries and benefits for the high school coaches had been embedded in the secondary teacher's amount, I pulled that out so that you could see what just all of the secondary coaches' costs are. So that's where you see the secondary coach is 643,000 in salaries plus benefits. So it's you know almost $800,000 uh, in cost to the school system for secondary athletics, middle schools as well as high schools. Um, the 350,000 is probably still a pretty accurate figure for what it costs for the middle schools. 
and of course we no longer get getting funding from the city for that. At the top of the next page, you'll see uh, you have approved earlier this year secondary academics coaches. So that's for the schools that have those particular programs and they would have academics coaches, coaches getting supplements. Uh, ESL teachers, I'll point out to you that ESL is a continually growing uh, program and the needs are continuing. So we, we did uh, budget two additional uh, teacher units for that. Uh, homebound is a new category. A quick question, just yes. out of curiosity. Where do most of these teachers for ESL, where are they mostly located? Is it Halcyon or? No, I would say Blue Baker, Morning View. Those are heavy. Have you someone to know that? They're, they're, uh, is that or Zenshaw? Right. Or I could tell you exactly where they are. And of course, many of them serve multiple schools. Mm -hmm. Title I funds some of ESL also, but the general fund we had to pick up more uh, of the share of providing ESL I just wanted services. to kind of know where that population was in the city. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, there are some large concentrations, but they're really throughout the district. Okay. I mean, you have some uh, Wilson. Uh, you know, you have some pockets, but the largest pockets are at uh, Blue Baker and Morningview. Okay. But there are pockets all throughout the district. Uh, right. <laughs> when I was in the city, uh, our home, I see you have six homebound teachers here. Yes, what, we, what we used to do, and I you all, are we doing something different? The homebound teachers were regular teachers that were paid uh, back to school hours to work with the homebound students. Now we hire homebound students and putting them somewhere when, because that way you got to pay them benefits, you got to pay their insurance, you got to pay. Uh, Medicare, all of that for those teachers could they not be they are not in the classrooms. What have we changed that? Are we no longer well, this, this is an that? effort I think to better serve the homebound students, which is also a growing population, and serve them during the day as opposed to in the evenings. And uh, and then the teachers that are being used here, if they're not being utilized fully as a homebound teacher, then they're being used as substitutes. So it would then reduce the cost of substitutes. So this is a, an effort to address homebound a little differently. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So then, okay. So we're paying benefits to them. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Let me just comment on that a little bit. What we were discovering in some of our subs that we were putting in some of our classrooms that was problematic for us, particularly in the area of special ed. So we wanted to get people who at least knew what was going on in that area. And the vast majority of their salary will be paid for through the sub pool because we really needed people going in those classrooms who had some knowledge of what they were doing. And I can give you an example uh, at those points that might be so might uh, I'll give you an example later. Okay, the rest of the page are RTC alternative, elementary special ed. Not really many changes there. Uh, top of the next page, page five, secondary special ed, very similar. Uh, gifted the same, career tech. Sometimes career tech is simply a reclassification of a position. It may be uh, what was considered regular secondary now becomes career tech. So you may have more career tech one year or less the next year. It's really a combination of regular secondary and career tech. So that increase there is, is probably more of a classification of the classes that they're actually teaching. Um, at the bottom of that page, you'll see your student materials uh, allocation. That's the only uh, allocation in the budget this year from the state, $300. You know, we used to get uh, technology and professional development, library enhancement, and All common members. purchases. Right. And none of that, the only thing that's made it back into the budget this, this year, and it did, as it did last year, was the $300 uh, per certified unit. Our textbook allocation is still woefully inadequate, 981, 458, 3135 per student. I will tell you that that's what we will spend in fiscal year 14 for textbooks. Uh, although we will, we do have as many school districts throughout the state have an agreement with publishers warehouse to actually to, because you're purchasing textbooks often for multiple years and entering the contracts for multiple years you can actually spread out 
as you pay it. So, um, so that's the amount that we'll fund for for textbooks next year. Yeah. Yes. I think that we looked at it a little bit, but not a, a lot. We have to look at our E-rate monies, and we don't know exactly what we're still going to get on that and how we can use that. Our, we are um, we have digital books for our math books. We have that option. That's about as far as we've gone at this point. Yeah. Uh, I guess theoretically, you could have one pad and you can use one that one pad. The problem is, is that many school districts who have technology have that budget, they can do that. The state gives us zero for technology. So that makes it a little difficult for us. That's right. It would be, uh, before I arrived, you were getting money for library books, uh, instructional materials, um, technology between about 675 or more. Um, it went to zero. They have not uh, given us any money for that area since. So uh, the school districts that are doing that have a little bit uh, better uh, tax base and private schools of course that's part of what the kids buy, purchase themselves and we can't do that so it really makes it very difficult which is why last year when we got the donation from Porch Creek Indians for a million dollars we put that money in smart boards because we were trying to do that technology that we could do that really is a, and the digital math books that we will have this year that's certainly um, a step for us. But the reason the library gave us those books was because they were going digital. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are thinking about the board, right? I would like to make it so that there would be some way to find some number. We want to know what you're saying. Oh. Thank you. You know? Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, we were just talking about e-books for the schools and, and my suggestion was to look at uh, having our grant folks look to see if there is a pilot program that we can get funded for a school to, to do that. I could ask Dr. Bazin to look at that. Yeah. We can start. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, on the next page, I'm at the top of page six. Um, you have the school improvement allocation. It's certainly not a lot, but it's helpful for the school. It's twenty dollars per student that's directly to the school for the operation of that school. Um, not a whole lot new. There is a district resource officer we're having to pick up in the general fund this year, so that's why that's listed there. School nurses. It looks like there's a couple of uh, extra RNs, but actually we're again having to pick up the funding. Uh, shifting it from IDEA because of those cuts. Um, not a whole lot more on the rest of that page. On the next page, page seven, um, there are in the middle of the page where you see senior high activities directors, and then right below that, you've got student social services. Let me just say that in this category, you know. Ms. Johnson reworked the alternative education program and, um, and somewhat her office, and that's, that's reflected here, but the overall cost of shifting all of that is less than it was. So, uh, you know, for it may look like there's two extra, there are actually fewer administrators actually in the alternative education programs. And like we have Dr. Dean listed here uh, as the director of the alternative education program but we don't have principals for those schools like we did last year. So there's an overall net cut there. Um, I think that was a concern for some people that it looked like the staffing was getting larger and actually it went less. Right. Um, and the same thing is true for the instructional support department. There's actually fewer people this year have paid out of the general fund uh, for working in that program than there was. Then on page eight, um, uh, you said a uh, few are paid out from the general fund than was. Are that some being paid out of another fund? I think we're trying to utilize staff that, are, that were already being funded out of federal funds, but utilize them to help and support the construction support department. Particularly in Title I, there were some positions that 
you know, drive to support that department as opposed to the way that the NDE was. In other words, just a point that the, um, I guess the support services do some of the Title I funding. Well, it's, it's a system-wide effort. So uh, it's just that we're utilizing them in a different way. But the point is really for the general fund that there is a reduction in the cost of the general fund for that department. Now on page eight, uh, near the top you see instructional support services. I just point out to you we do have the art classes that have begun at several of our schools. I think it's, I can't remember how many, 15, 17? 10 or 11, first semester 10 or 11, but it's several. And then the data desegregation services that the uh, True North that had uh, presented earlier, the true cost of that is about $290,000, about $30,000, $29,000 a month for 10 months. But uh, we received notice that each of, well, we're just going to get a, a grant for a total of $140,000, which will reduce those costs. So that's why the 150 is listed here. Um, Accreditation expenses now that we're out of the major uh, effort for accreditation, we could reduce those this year. And Teach for America is up because we have a few more Teach for America uh, teachers. <coughs> uh, in here, uh, we included that in our amended budget for fiscal year 13. Then after the IB, you see the reading coaches. Again, that's where the, the uh, Alabama Reading Initiative coaches are. and. Uh, where we're really spending two million fifty something thousand dollars, uh, but we're only going to get from the state the half million because we've already got a million and a half by the end of the year. Go back to line thirty, page thirty. Uh, professional development allocation zero. Where, where are we? we don't have that's that state allocation, and they have an out, they haven't funded that for several years now. Ms. Allen does a very good job in using Title II funds to provide a our... Yes, ma'am. Now, and, and Ms. Allen's position is funded out of the general fund, but the professional development activities are primarily funded out of Title II. So. And it shows you that the state is giving us more money for that. What we have here on uh, professional development across from that Teach for America, how does that, um, I guess, well, te teach for because that's a thing that's for their professional development. That's part of the agreement. Um, for their professional Yes, sir. For, for their professional Teach for America professional development. Yes, sir. Not including on the regular teachers in regards to that, receiving that same professional development. It's, it's a $5,000 cost per teacher for the program where they provide their unique professional development for these teachers. And so that's the cost. Okay, the librarians, the only thing you'll see there probably is the additional part across the uh, librarian. On the next page, page nine, uh, you will see at the top the library aids. That, those positions were eliminated because the state eliminated funding for those positions. And I don't know of any system in the state that is funding library aids anymore. Uh, then you've got principals. Again, that's all uh, just because of uh, uh, the park crossing and moving fuse, the acceleration academy from HRAA to fuse and, and all of that. So there's some some internal adjustments uh, within that, but the increases would be primarily because of the opening of park crossing. Same thing would be tr true with security, additional for uh, security officers at park crossing. Uh, I will tell you in this section, and we're getting into. Uh, security, operations, maintenance. As I said earlier, all of these are woefully underfunded. And uh, so if we had an extra five million that I could put into operations, maintenance, security, it could be used. Um, so um, just know that in order to get a balanced budget, these are the figures that we came up with. But it doesn't necessarily indicate that these are adequate funds to fund these programs. Uh, did increase uh, security uh, equipment a little. Yes, sir. I have a question. 
the five thousand dollars per each one of their feet that they have in place is this ongoing, or if they if they're here for a couple of years and they're participating in the professional development program, are we still obligated to pay for? I think they have two years. Eh? Well, it's an annual cost for each teacher for it's the annual, for the professional development they receive each year. Five thousand so dollars each. Yes. You know, each teacher. Yes. Okay. Now, is that ongoing or just for the two years that they have committed to being? As long as they're in the Teach for America program, it would be ongoing. This is a two-year commitment. That's what I'm saying. But, yeah. but for example, this year we've got some different ones that we had last year. So if they're part of that program, whether it's the first year or the second year they're in, it's still the five thousand per student. You know, let's, let's say we had fifteen last year and ten of those came back this year, so this is their second year. If they were to con continue being employed with us, they would no longer be a part of the Teach for America program, and that would not go away. That would go away. It would, it would go away, but then you know you may choose to get additional Teach for America teachers. So. For the number that you get, that would be the cost of the So in other words, we lost one third of the- I didn't say that, that was, that was a hypothetical. If I don't know the number. We have 10, and we, I mean, we have 10, and we got 10 left, that's one third lost, and we lost the asset. That was a hypothetical, I just said, for example. I, I don't know the numbers, uh, but this budget includes for us 20 Teach for America teachers. Okay, top of page 10, I'll try to go faster. This is where you see your reduction of custodial employees. Then you get into the, uh, the maintenance area, logistics. Uh, not many changes there at the bottom of the page. Uh, increased a little for supplies and uh, refuge collection. But again, those are not really adequate numbers. Top of page 11, utilities. Uh, we do continue to see a reduction of the cost of utilities and even factoring in the cost of our energy education contract, uh, we are still able to reduce those costs somewhat this next year. In the maintenance materials and maintenance services area, again, I tried to increase that as much as I could, but it's, uh, again, not adequate. Then at the bottom of page 11, transportation, not a whole lot of changes in personnel or in the total cost of the program, except for the fact that we did reduce uh, special education aids to only those that their IEPs call for it because the state is no longer funding us for that. So, um, and I will tell you also, Mr. Cox has done a good job of uh, trying to utilize retired personnel as retired uh, as uh, bus drivers. Because anytime you can use a retiree versus an active employee, uh, just the insurance cost and savings is you know eight thousand over eight thousand dollars, much less the other costs. So he's done a good job of uh, increasing the number of retirees that he uses for bus drive. Okay, then on page twelve, there really aren't many changes at all for transportation, for the school board, for the superintendent. Uh, on page thirteen, you get into assistant superintendents. Um, and again, that's based on the current structure. Uh, where you, in, in this particular category, you have uh, the assistant superintendents for operations and the two in instructional support. And by the way, I usually say this at the beginning of this. The reason these are listed in the order they are is because it's the accounting system and it's just the number. I'm just increasing, starting out with instruction, which is 1100 going down to the very end for central administration, which is in the 6,000, so that's the order for that. Okay. Um, really no other changes on that page. On page 14, and no other changes there. Uh, on page uh, 15, continuing into technology. Uh, I'll just point out to you, there's a note in the middle of that page um, that Mr. Dove, Director of Technology Support Services Technical, um, he and his staff sort of reworked the categories of the budget to better fit the way things are now. So we recategorized things, but the total cost uh, that we have budgeted is the same as last year and this year. 
Uh, I will point out to you at the top of page 15, and this is important, that we are budgeting $557,000 in expenditures out of E-rate this year. We've never done that before, but E-rate has, uh, has built up a reserve. We need a reserve in the E-rate fund source in case some of these E-rate applications are never funded, and therefore we have to uh, dip into that. But in the E-rate refunds, this particular thing is primarily for the ITS contract, for the services they provide, and we will get most of that back. So in this budget, which you don't see here because it's not in the general fund, but in the E-rate refunds fund source, we budgeted 557000 in expenditures, 500000 in revenue, which would be reimbursement for these expenses, and we end up about the same as we begin the year with, with E-rate. Uh, E-rate is, I think, probably all school systems have become dependent on E-rate for their technology needs. Since the state doesn't give us anything. Okay. Um, human resources. Uh, about the same as last year. Of course, we don't know what the, the new structure will be. There have been some changes during this past year. Uh, the rest of the page is basically the same. Top of page 16, about the same. And let me just point out to you, I think you know this, from um, the, the resident, the, the UC Second Chance Program, Brantwood and Residential Treatment Centers. The reason we have those as line items in the budget uh, they are bed count facilities, and we are sort of a conduit for state funding for them. So second chance, in our ADM, we have 60, quote, beds. That's part of the ADM for the school system. 60 beds for second chance. Uh, Brantwood this year is 36, and residential treatment centers is uh, 40. And those dollars you see there are the amounts that are generated because of those beds that we report. But again, we're just really a conduit for those programs. And then finally, the child nutrition program transfers out. That's the pass-through funds, uh, and uh, that was positively affected by some changes that were made in the child nutrition program this year. Last page, which is the summary. Uh, you see our total expenditures, 211 million. That actually exceeds uh, revenue by a million four eighty, but again because um, we have a million and a half in expenditures for ARI in this budget, but the revenue is not there because it's part of the beginning fund balance, then you can have up to that negative million and a half. And then so so that leaves us uh, projected uh, a little over nine million next year. Um, the next page, real quickly, is the uh, breakdown of the budget of revenues and expenditures by percentages. You can see that in the total budget, we get about 60% of our funding right there, 59.96%. Uh, in state funding, 13.32. In federal funding, local taxes, a big important part of our budget, 22%. And then other various things, total 4%. And then I think in expenditures by function, those are always interesting. You can see instructional services, the bulk of our money is spent, as it should be, on instructional services. And uh, in the general fund, 60%, in the total budget, 53, almost 54%, and you see the other amounts. You'll also see in the general administration services line, in the general fund, it's 7.6 million, total 8.9 million. And again, that's dependent on the state uh, accounting system is how you code people and expenditures. But you can see that the general administration services for the general fund is 3.58% for the total budget, 3.31%, which would be, I think, very low and compare very favorably to other school systems in terms of the percentage spent for general administration services. Then objects at the very bottom, you'll see in the general fund, almost 88% of our budget is salaries and benefits. For the total budget, it's almost 79%, and we have the others there. So obviously salaries and benefits, people are the primary driver of our budget. Of course, that's the primary way that the system operates. So that's, yes, ma'am. One last question for me. 
Where on this page 16, I didn't see, I see salaries for the staff attorney and paralegal, but I don't see anything on here for the superintendent secretary. That would be on page, I can't get up here. On page 13, near the bottom, it says central administration clerical staff. And that's really the secretary for the superintendent as well as the secretary for those three assistant superintendents. Those would be coded as central administration. So all of this is the salary of four people? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then the very last three pages you have are simply um, straight from our county manual. That if somebody really wants to understand what makes up instructional services, then they can just look at this page and, and see instruction is instruction. That is direct instruction, teachers, aides, what happens in the classroom. But then when you look at instructional support, then you have attendance services and on down the line. You can read that. So hopefully that would be helpful to someone if they really want to try to analyze this further. With that, I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Excellent job. Thank you.